Brown eyes have the genotype big B, little b. Blue eyes are a recessive trait. If two parents have the genotype big B, little b, what is the likelihood their child will have blue eyes? To find this out, just go ahead and draw a square with four little parts to it. And then you want to grab the parents. Now they're both big B, little b. You're going to put one along the side here and one across the top there. And then you're going to split up the letters. Next, you're going to find out what the kids look like. They're just going to be the combinations of the letters on the inside. So that one's big B, big B. This one's going to be one big, one little. Same with that one. And the last one, two little letters. Next, what is the likelihood the child will have blue eyes? But they say blue eyes are a recessive trait. That means it's only going to show up if you have two little letters. So that's going to be blue eyes. But anytime you have a capital, it's going to be brown. So the other three kids, brown eyes. So finally, only one kid out of the four has blue eyes, or 25%. Okay, the next type. Here we're finding what would improve the experimental design for this study. The first paragraph is just the intro, but here's the setup. One healthy and one unhealthy forest are studied to determine the presence or absence of mycorrhizal networks underground. Two deep soil samples are taken from each forest site. Microbes are extracted from the soil, and the ratio of fungi to bacteria is determined using a test. So again, what would improve the design? A lot of the questions are going to ask about sample size, but notice we're only taking two deep soil samples, and that's not that much, because you want those to represent the whole forest, so you actually want to get quite a few samples. The first one says testing single samples, well, that's definitely no good because that's not going to be representative, so that's out. The next one, testing only soil that's easy to access, that's called convenience sampling, and that's not good either. You want a wide variety. The third one, testing more samples from each forest site, and bingo, that's exactly it. So the more samples, the better the design. The next one's asking, what is the dependent variable in this experiment? Now the dependent variable, that's the data you collect. Coral reefs have been badly damaged by both pollution and climate change. To help restore a damaged reef, a group of scientists played sounds from a healthy reef with underwater speakers. The sounds included snapping of shrimp and grunts from fish. Researchers recorded how many fish swam to the reef before and after the sounds were played. But that's it right there because researchers recorded, that's the data they collect, how many fish swam to the reef. So right away, it's got to be C, and that's the dependent variable. Now the independent, that's the one that you control. And in this experiment, it's whether you play sound or not. So the last one, that's our independent variable, whether sounds were played. Okay, the next one's a food web, but the key is the arrow points to what eats it. The raccoon is a secondary consumer that preys on frogs. In other words, it eats frogs. So let's highlight all those connections there. But this one says the raccoon gets eaten by a frog. Same with B, so both of those are out. But these guys are good. The frog gets eaten by the raccoon. Okay, next, foxes and hawks are both predators of raccoons, so they eat them. Let's check that out. But this one, the fox is getting eaten by the raccoon, so that's no good. But here, the raccoon's eaten by the fox, so that's the correct one here. What percent of lemon seeds did not flower? Now we're only interested in the lemon ones, so 50 were planted and only 12 flowered. So it's actually much easier to find what percent did flower. Well, using that data, 12 flowered out of the 50, so let's write that. And then we could use the calculator. We'll do 12 divided by 50. 0 0.24. But then that's the same thing as 24%. Next, we're going to find what percent did not flower. Because there's only two options. If 24% flowered, the rest of them did not. So just subtract that out of 100. And that'll leave us with 76%. So that's the percent that did not flower. But of course, you could just do 50 minus 12, that'll give you 38. Divide that by 50, 
And that's another way to get 76 there. Here we're given a chemical reaction. We have sodium, that's the first thing. It reacts with oxygen, the second thing, and it forms sodium oxide there. But they're all asking about units, and those are just the numbers in front. So sodium, there's four units of that. If there's nothing in front, it's always a one, so one unit of oxygen, and two units sodium oxide. So then we're just looking to see which statement matches that. But the one that matches this is going to be B. One unit of oxygen, that's on the left side there. It's going to produce two units sodium oxide, and that's on the right side. To find the mean, it's the same thing as finding the average, and that's just a two-step process. First, you're just going to add everything up, and I've already done that. It came to 2712. And then you're going to divide by how many things you have. We're talking about four different years, so just divide by four. And let's go ahead and see that. 2712 divided by four, 678. So that's the mean. And it's pretty cool because that's how many exoplanets were discovered each year. So a lot of possibilities for some Earth-like planets there. Okay, next. Here we're given a scatter plot, but they tell us that these things are directly proportional. Weight and displacement. Now weight and displacement, if they're directly proportional, means the data points are going to lie in a straight line. So how many lines can we draw through here? Well, there's one, two, three. So really, that's it. We're just looking for them to mention three lines in the answers here. And B has that. These must be from three materials because the data falls along three lines. In other words, this is one mattress with weight placed on it, a second one, and a third one. This is another genetics one. Cystic fibrosis is a genetic disorder that results from the inheritance of two recessive alleles. Remember, that means the small letter. Symptoms include coughing and repeated lung infections. What is the chance that a child might inherit this disorder if one parent is homozygous dominant and the other one is heterozygous? Homozygous just means two of the same letter. So it could be homozygous dominant or recessive. If it's dominant, it's a capital letter, recessive, lowercase. But we're interested in homozygous dominant, so two capital C's. The next one, it's heterozygous, that means different letters. So it's going to be one capital, one lowercase. And that's the other parent there. Next, we want to find out about the kids. Let's make our square. And then we'll put one across the top there, the other parent along the side. And you know what to do. Let's go ahead and combine them. So we get two capitals, two capitals, and then one of each, one of each. Next, we want to find what is the chance the child might inherit this disorder. But CF, it's going to be from two recessive alleles here. And that's going to happen with two lowercase letters here. But none of the kids have that. So there's actually a 0% chance here. If you're given a cladogram, it's just going to organize species into different groups. It shows evolutionary relationships. Which statement can be inferred from this cladogram? All species evolved from trout. But that's not what this shows, actually. It doesn't show one thing evolving into the next, evolving into the next. So that's not true. OK, the next one, salamanders evolved into lizards. But we just said they don't evolve one thing into the next like that. They just share common characteristics. So that's not true. The third one, lizards have both lungs and claws. But wherever you are in the diagram, they have everything below it. So they do have claws. They do have lungs. So see, that is true here. And then the last one, the original ancestor had lungs. Well, that's not true, but it would be true if they said jaws instead. So just to see another true statement there. This one's asking what is the weakness of the sampling technique? Carbon-14 dating is accurate for estimating the age of certain objects that were used in the relatively recent past by human activities. And then we've got this graph. If four objects were sampled, what is the weakness of this technique? Well, let's look closely. It's only accurate 
for estimating ages that were relatively recent in the past that even involved human activity. However, if we look closely, this data point 66 million years ago, that was the age of the dinosaurs, so no humans were around back then. In other words, carbon-14 dating is not going to be good for dating something that's this old, so that data point is no good. And then D has that, one sample is outside the acceptable range for this technique. So just be careful of the extreme highs or lows, as they may or may not be good to sample from. This one's asking about the molarity of a substance. To do that, just check out the units here. They say you want the number of moles, and then the slash means divide by the number of liters. But we have the number of moles right here, 0 0.4, the number of liters, 8. So really, just divide those two things. So once again, let's use the calculator they give you. 0 0.4 divided by 8. So the molarity is 0 0.05, and there we have it there. Okay, next one. The table compares how long it takes three cell phone chargers to charge a phone. Based on the table, Model 2 is how many times more efficient than Model 1. But to be able to compare these, we want the same units. Let's convert this to minutes. To do that, each hour has 60 minutes, just multiply by that. And using the calculator, that'll give us 150 minutes. Next, to find how many times this could go into this, just use division, 150 divided by 30, and that'll be five. So therefore, this one is five times more efficient. You could be given a formula to use like this. Here, a force of 204 newtons is applied to the handles of a wheelbarrow to move it. Now let's pause there. Is this one the input force or the output force? We'll notice that this is what we're applying, so that's going to make that the bottom number or the input. Next, the total weight of the wheelbarrow is 530.4. Well, we know that that has to be the other number, so that's going to go up top because that's what we're moving, so that's the output there. But once again, let's use the calculator. We'll go ahead and set up a fraction. The top number, 530.4. The bottom number, just click down, 204. And 2.6. So that's the final answer, and that's the mechanical advantage here. And just one final type. I've seen a molarity one that's a little bit more complicated like this, so let's check it out. Now we know to do molarity, you just want the moles divided by liters. And here they say the mole is this statement. Now we want to get moles up top in this fraction, so let's put the one mole up top, the 36.5 grams underneath it. When two things are the same, you can always just make them a fraction. Next, we want to get liters in the bottom, but they mention liters in the first statement here. We're going to make another fraction. Let's put one liter in the bottom and 1050 grams up top. But that's it, because now, when you have the same letter up top and bottom, those are both going to cancel. And that does leave us with moles up top, liters in the bottom, so that's it. Okay, let's use the calculator one more time. We've got a fraction, we've got 1050. That's the top. Now it is multiplied by 1, but that's not going to change it. And then 36.5 times 1 in the bottom, but that just stays 36.5. And 28.76, let's write that. That's how many moles per liter. But there's one extra step here. We want to know how much hydrochloric acid, and that's only 8.5%. So let's multiply by 8.5%. And that'll be the last step here. To do that, just do times 8.5, and then second left parenthesis to get a percent. So final answer, 2.44, and there we have it. So that's the molarity. Here's a video with more GD science practice problems for you. And check out my website for more practice there as well. Let me know what questions you have, what else you want me to cover. Good luck, you got these. We'll see you in the next video. Toodles.